to the rest of the news to a story that tragically just won't go away, the Fukushima nuclear crisis. Radioactive fish are now swimming in U.S. waters. Scientists have, for the first time, discovered bluefin tuna that were contaminated by the Fukushima nuclear crisis in Japan last year, swimming off the coast of California. Radioactive cesium, 10 times above the normal level, was found in the fish, though health officials say the levels are too low to be considered a health threat. Then again, no amount of radiation is good for you. Meanwhile, back at the crippled nuclear plant, a bulge was detected in the walls at Reactor 4, increasing fears that the structure holding tens of thousands of highly radioactive spent fuel rods is not sound. Should the Reactor 4 building give way, it could trigger a nuclear disaster far worse than Chernobyl. For the latest on all of this, I'm joined by Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Um, first of all, the bluefin tuna. You were predicting this a year ago on this program. What's the status uh, of the tuna and seafood in general? Are we, you know, are, I got my Geiger counter, but I haven't gone down to the fish shop. And besides that, or the fish market, besides that, we're on the East Coast, not the West Coast. What's going on? Well, first of all, you need special monitors to check the internal contamination of bluefin tuna. You would need to. You can't, you can't register cesium with a Geiger counter? Possibly if it's on the surface, uh, you could detect it. But this is deep embedded in the muscle of the tuna, and that's exactly where it would go in humans. And apparently what happened, this new study that's out, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, backed by researchers from uh, Stanford University, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, shows that the muscle tissue of the tuna is contaminated with radioactive cesium-137, radioactive cesium-134, unmistakably, undeniably from Fukushima Daiichi, the massive releases of radioactivity into the ocean, which was unprecedented in scale and in nature, that happened in March and April of 2011. And actually, these readings on the tuna were taken in August of 2011. So incredibly, it takes this long for the truth to come out, even in abbreviated Wait a minute. August was eight months ago, yeah. something like that? I mean, we, yeah. so nine months ago? So people who have been eating tuna for the last half a year have been eating cesium? We've been very concerned since the beginning of the catastrophe that the U.S. federal government has not been checking in anything close to an adequate way the food supply, especially the seafood supply, which is embedded with radioactivity. In this case, the tuna, which uh, spawned off the east coast of Japan, then swam across the ocean some 5,000 plus miles and arrived at Southern California in August of 2011. And that's, like you said, we discussed that, whether it's salmon, whether it's tuna. These predatory uh, fish of larger size have eaten smaller fish, which ate yet smaller fish, which ate plankton, all of which is concentrating the radioactivity up the food chain. So it's not just downstream. It's not just downwind. It's up the food chain over vast distances, over long periods of time. Which is how tuna f end up with such high mercury levels as well, because they're at the top of the food chain, or close to the top of the food chain in the ocean. Um, let's talk about cesium for a moment. My understanding, you know, I, in the setup, I said that the, the government is saying that this is um, 10 times normal levels. If I'm wrong, correct me, but my understanding is that radioactive cesium pretty much doesn't exist normally that the cesium left over from the Big Bang has long gone away and that it's only the byproduct of radioactive decay. And so the, the natural background level of cesium should be zero. So what is the normal level that this is 10 times of? Well, is that the leftovers from the above ground nuclear blasts and things like that? You're absolutely right. Uh, the hundreds and even thousands of atmospheric bomb tests that took place uh, starting in 1945 with Trinity in New Mexico, right. and then Hiroshima, and then Nagasaki, left radioactive cesium in the environment. But radioactive cesium-134 is relatively short-lived, a two-year half-life, which means it's more hazardous in the near term mm -hmm. as it decays quickly. So there is radioactive cesium-134 in the tuna. That is from Fukushima Daiichi. Radioactive cesium-137 has a longer half-life of 30 years, so 300 to 600 years of hazardous persistence. That is also So in, in 30 years, it's half as potent, and in 60 years, it's a quarter as potent, and 120. And to be conservative, you should really multiply the half-life by 20 to get the hazardous persistence. Okay. So a hazardous persistence for the cesium-134 is going to be more like 20 to 40 years. So how does cesium affect the human body? If you, if you eat some of this tuna, 
you know, what happens? It seeks human muscle tissue. And so one of the conditions that has come out of Chernobyl is called Chernobyl Heart. And there's actually an Oscar award winning documentary film called Chernobyl Heart that shows that in children, uh, heart pathology that you wouldn't expect to see until much older ages is present in epidemic numbers in Belarus, Ukraine, Western Russia, including things like holes in the heart. And the Belarusian scientists that determined the mechanism for the radioactive cesium causing this harm was thrown in prison for a number of years by the Belarusian dictatorship because wow. it has a pro-nuclear agenda. Wow. Now, and, and that would be presumably because the heart is a massive muscle and it's regenerating itself continuously, probably more aggressively than other muscles in the body. And so it's continually uptaking nutrients that you eat and the body thinks that cesium is potassium. Do I have that right? That's right. It yeah. cycles it through the same, same And you're cycle. right. It doesn't exist in nature. So the body doesn't know what to do with it. Treats it like potassium and that's And it, and it, it never excretes it because potassium is something we need. You want to hang it. The body wants to hang on to. Um, wow. That's amazing. Uh, and, and, and just to close that before we get to reactor four, safe levels of radiation. Again, my understanding is that one single particle, one single photon of, of radioactive energy, if it knocks DNA, the, the DNA strand in a, the, the gene of a, one cell the wrong way, you've got cancer. Um, typically what it does is it kills the cells, but just all it takes is one radioactive atom and one cell to meet in the, in the correct way and boom, you've got cancer. So how could there be any dose that is safe? It's a part of the nuclear establishment's attempt to bamboozle the public. Just like, uh, you know, radioactive cesium in nature, it's not in nature. This is artificial poison. Mm -hmm. And again, with the National Academy of Sciences going back decades, they've affirmed that any exposure to radioactivity, no matter how low the dose, carries a health risk of cancer. But those risks accumulate over a lifetime. So all of this downplaying of the radioactive cesium contamination in the tuna is yet another example of the nuclear establishment in industry and government trying to put people to sleep to these very real risks. Tobacco doesn't cause cancer. <laughs> Neither does nuclear. And they got away with that for decades. Yeah, yeah. And now the exact same scientists are the ones who are promoting, I mean, literally, some of the, the exact same scientists are promoting the idea that there's no such thing as global and warming and, and nuclear power is, is safe, yeah. Um, We've talked many times about Reactor 4. The, again, my recollection is that it's uniquely dangerous because it has both spent fuel rods in it and new fuel rods. They had offloaded the, the fuel from the reactor into the pool just before the earthquake. Is that, is that correct? Right. The less, the less used fuel rods would be more apt to start a nuclear chain reaction inadvertently. So that's right. the danger there. And these are in a pool in the roof of this, of this 10 or 12 story tall building that is had its sides blown out and is listing? Yes, and the most recent news is there's a bulge on the side of the building, so that's raised concerns about the stability of the building itself. The, the pool floor has been supported by steel jacks since shortly into this catastrophe, over a year. So any boil down of the pool, it has lost cooling even last month for 24 hours. The cooling uh, system malfunctioned. So it began to heat up over that 24-hour period. Or if the building collapses or the pool floor falls out, that would be an instant drain down. In either case, once the fuel is exposed to air, it's just a matter of some hours at most before that's on fire. And 100% of the radioactive cesium could be released by the fire in the smoke. Up to eight times Chernobyl cesium releases are in that one pool at Fukushima Daiichi. And, wow. And if that one goes down, there's six reactors at that site, seven waste sites, if, if I remember seven correct. Seven pools, right. So what kind of risk does that represent? And what are the probabilities or possibilities of, react, of reactor building for uh, catching on fire, as you suggested, and that spreading? Well, the Japanese uh, diplomat Matsumura, who's called international attention to this issue through his hard work, uh, points out that 50 meters away from the Unit 4 building is the common pool at Fukushima Daiichi. The so big pool. The biggest one with the most waste in it. So if that Unit 4 pool goes up in flames, the entire site's going to have to be evacuated. And if cooling goes down for whatever reason in those other pools, then they're going to boil dry and catch on fire too. We have those risks here in the United States. Just by way of example, the Pilgrim nuclear power plant that just got a 20-year license rubber stamp from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, although the chairman uh, dissented yet again, four to one vote, has 
a lot more waste in it than the Unit 4 pool at Fukushima Daiichi. Every fuel assembly ever generated at Pilgrim, so close to Boston, Massachusetts, is still in the pool there. Amazing. Close to 3,000 assemblies versus Unit 4 has 1,300. Incredible. Well, Kevin, we have to wrap it up. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Tom. Keep up the great work. Kevin Camps. Given everything we've seen over the last year, from Fukushima to contaminated sea life to now radiation here in the United States in our tuna, does anyone out there still think nuclear power is a good idea? If we continue our addiction to the world's most expensive and most dangerous form of energy, it's just a matter of time before we too get burned.